Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Luke Tannen, and I'm Executive Director of Chicago Innovation, an organization that supports local innovators and entrepreneurs, which is also a proud customer of Wintrust, like many of you in the audience today. On behalf of Wintrust and the Chicago Cubs, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's virtual event, a talk with Tom Ricketts, who will be in conversation with the founder and chairman of Wintrust, Ed Waymer. And before we bring out our speakers, I have a couple quick things to point out. If you have a question, please send it to us via the Zoom Q&A, as we will be saving time for audience questions. We also received questions from some of you in advance, and we'll have those on hand too. And keep an eye out for a couple polling questions, because we also want to get your thoughts. Now on to our speakers. First, I will start with Ed. I've gotten to know Ed the past handful of years, ever since Wintrust became a sponsor of Chicago Innovation. In that time, I've gotten to know Ed the innovator, Ed the business leader, Ed the civic advocate, Ed the family man, and I've also heard from his buddy Angelo Buffalino that Ed the golfer is quite formidable too. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen the way that Ed and Wintrust have truly become Chicago's bank by being a friend and ally to countless small and large companies in the city. Our organization would certainly not be where it is today without Ed's support. And the Chicago region would not be the same bustling and vibrant hub of creative, entrepreneurial, and business activity without him and Wintrust either. Now, moving on to Tom Ricketts. Tom is the executive chairman of the beloved Chicago Cubs. When the Ricketts family was introduced as the new owner of the Cubs, Tom outlined three goals for the organization. Win the World Series, preserve and improve Wrigley Field, and be a good neighbor. Well, we all know that they did number one, win the World Series in 2016, ending a historic 108 year drought. As for goal number two, Forbes wrote an article in 2019 with the headline of Wrigley Field renovations are nothing short of spectacular. And if you're familiar with Wrigley Field before and after, you know that Tom achieved goal number two. And as for goal number three, be a good neighbor, I think that all starts with what you do in your own neighborhood. And as a Lakeview resident myself, who loves taking his two four-year-old boys to Wrigleyville during a game day or not, I can tell you mission accomplished with goal number three. With that, it is my pleasure to now turn it over to tonight's speakers, Ed Waymer and Tom Ricketts. Thanks, Luke. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna do my Harry Carey here. You know, Ricketts spelled backwards is sticker. <laughs> Grab a few Budweiser's and let's go through some questions. Seriously, Tom, thanks for doing this today. Um, we appreciate it. Thanks to Chicago Innovation for providing us with the, um, the uh, technology necessary to talk to all of you today. So thank you very much. You're doing well, Tom. Yeah, I'm doing great, Ed. I'm happy to be here. And uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing, seeing what's on your mind tonight. <laughs> well, that'll be interesting. <laughs> um, Let's start with the most frequently asked question I've gotten from everybody, which is, can we expect to see fans in Wrigley yet this year? Yeah, that's a great question. I would doubt this year we're going to have fans back in the ballpark. Um, I know there are some, you know, I, I mean, I, I, there are some jurisdictions where they're getting closer to having that approved. Uh, the mayor um, and the governor have both been pretty open-minded and, and trying to be thoughtful and, and trying to find ways to, uh, to make it all work. But, but given that it's already kind of the end of August, we have one more month of regular season and then, um, and then, and then playoffs. I, I'm kind of thinking it's probably not going to happen this year. And um, we're sad, obviously, you know, and, 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 you know, me, you see me at games, like my favorite thing in the world is walking around a full Wrigley field and um, it just can't happen this year, but um, hopefully uh, fingers crossed that, uh, you know, by opening day next year, we'll be able to welcome back fans. That'd be great. First opening day, day I've missed in a long time. Uh, yeah, it wasn't quite a regular opening day this year, but uh, no. hopefully, hopefully we'll get back, get it back on track. What a year to start the marquee network. How's that working out for you? Um, yeah, kind of an awkward year for that too. I mean, you know, um, starting a channel that, that uh, plays baseball games and then not have any baseball games. But, uh, but the Marquee Network is off to a, a great start. Um, you know, it obviously started a few months later than we hoped it would with, with the live programming, but uh, I give our guys a lot of credit. They did a lot of um, special shows and filled a lot of, of airtime in, uh, in the 
in the quarantine months and in the months before baseball started with, with great Cubs programming. And, um, and then now the games are on. I think everyone has really enjoyed the programming quality. The uh, people really like, you know, we, they like the fact we're dropping in uh, former players as extra, extra booth, booth members at times to jump in on the games. The pregame shows and postgame shows are doing really well. Um, the ratings are ridiculous. By far the number one television program in Chicago during prime time is Cubs baseball, twice as, twice as high as number two. So um, it's, you know, it's been great. Um, I, I just, um, you know, I obviously got a late jump. But, uh, but, you know, it's, we're really excited about it. And, you know, and we're excited about it for the Chicagoland area, but also um, part of the reason we want our own channel is to be able to do our own programming. Obviously, we've done, um, you know, specials about the Cubs and, and really make it a Cub focus. But we're also, because, um, you know, because of the different setup, we're able to be broadcast more broadly through the Midwest. So we picked up a lot of homes in Des Moines and parts of Iowa and, uh, you know, um, you know, Indianapolis and other big parts of Indiana. So, and not only is it um, better serving our fans, but it's serving more fans. And it's uh, thus far a big success. That's great. I'm sorry I had to turn down your offer to be at the 2 a.m. slot, the Ed Wehmer show at 2 a.m. on the Marquis <laughs> work. I had a lot of material, but Dorothy said I couldn't do it. So, you can do it if you stay in your Harry Carey impersonation the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't happening. Um, I, you know, the, uh, the, I think that the, the uh, programming has been great. I have a simple question. Is there a guy who actually hits the button and says home run and the crowd noise, it goes home run crowd noise, boo, whatever? Yeah, yeah there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a sound technician in charge of that. Um, it was pretty interesting. We had some exhibition games at Wrigley Field early on. And the, uh, the lag time between a hit or, uh, or an out and when the cheer came was, was comical. It might be like five or six seconds later, you'd hear a random cheer that didn't make any sense anymore. Uh, but our guys worked really hard on it. We, we studied a bunch of different types of crowd noise. Um, the league did not allow us to add booze for certain players on the Brewers. The, um, so, but but we, uh, we, we went back to real Wrigley crowd noise. And so um, try to make it authentic as possible. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, the players actually requested that there was white noise. Um, and because, uh, you know, they they were worried about, like, being able to hear guys talking to each other's dugouts and those kind of things. And then uh, for us also, like, getting at the right volume has been a complicated thing. We uh, we had a little bit of a shouting match with with an opponent early in the season because someone said something that got overheard in one of the dugouts. And so, like, we raised the volume a little bit so the players can't hear each other too much. But um, anyway, it's, I think I think it's kind of getting there. I mean, I, I don't know, you'll uh, you'll have to tell me if you think it's if it's if it's going okay. But but there is a guy hitting the button. I could do that probably. Yeah, maybe maybe. <laughs> I I, I, can, I can push buttons. We can put you up in the scoreboard. We you know the, <laughs> it's kind of that's hot. manual labor. No <laughs> manual labor for me. Yeah, sure. um, the uh, interesting all these changes now. You've got a new manager. What's the difference between Joe and uh, Papa, Grandpa Ross? Yeah, um, very, very different in style. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the things that made Joe a, a great manager for us is um, he, he tries to take pressure out of the game. Uh, he tries to get players to re relax more, be in the moment. He will, um, you know, he kind of de-emphasized a little bit of the, the extra work people do. He didn't want players to come to mark the, the, the ballpark way too early. You know, one of the first things Joe said to me when we were interviewing him is, I said, what's one thing that makes you a different kind of manager? And he said, well, I, I don't want the players there all day. And he said, like, because what happens is 7 o'clock game, a guy shows up at 3, then a guy shows up at 2. Before you know it, a guy shows up at 1, then all the guys think they should be there at 1. And his line was, sitting around drinking Red Bull, playing Xbox hockey, doesn't make you a better baseball player. Just stay home. So, so he, that very much his approach and, and, and I'm sure was critical for us, particularly in, in 15, 16, and 17 in those deep playoff runs to remind players that, um, you know, to, to relax and be themselves and, and, um, and just, just be in the moment when the moment comes. Uh, Ross, is, um, Ross is a little bit different manager. He's, he's more emotional. Uh, he's, he's given a couple of team speeches with something Joe would never, never really did. Um, 
he uh, he likes to remind players how uh, how important every game is, how lucky they are to be here, how important this game is to um, to the fans, and um, and he's just got a, a much more um, much more engaged emotional style of inter in interacting with the players. I think that um, I think David Ross is going to be one of the great all time managers because he um, he just he, he just has a way of relating to everybody. And whether you're one of his former teammates from the, the 2016 team or whatever, or, or one of the brand new guys, he can relate to you. And whether you're a 20 year veteran or a rookie, he can relate to you. So yeah, how's, uh, that working with, um, how's that working with the older teammates like Rizzo and especially uh, the big pitcher, um, Johnny Lester? Yeah. I, well, yeah, they were all close. I mean, in fact, um, you know, as Cub fans know, John Lester, um, you know, bringing in David Ross came at the same time as John Lester. And um, in part because, you know, one of the things Lester um, really wanted was, well, one way he said it indirectly to me was, I don't want to be the only old guy on a team. At the time he was like 30, I've seen that old. But, but the, uh, but really what he was saying was, you know, you know for, for winning teams and a winning clubhouse, there are certain players in the league that, um, that are always value added. And when, when Lester came over, he highly recommended we talk to David Ross. Of course, Theo knew David Ross from, from, from the past and was interested in going forward. So they've been, they've been friends and battery mates for a long time. Um, they get along very well. They're very close. He, uh, they joke about, you know, uh, they joke about, you know, I got to go pull Lester out of the game. I don't, you know, I don't know if he's going to yell at me or curse me out or whatever. But, but in the end, um, John's a true professional. And uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't had a negative impact on anybody, um, even the former teammates. Uh, what's it like sitting in the stands now? It's just like eight of you. They're 100 <laughs> feet apart. <laughs> it's, it's painful. It's awful. <laughs> like the, so, and you know my routine. Like, I, I like going to the games. I have a list of people I want to go say hi to. I, I walk through the crowd. I give out baseballs to kids. I have a whole, like, I have a whole, a whole, Shtick, I, and I like to do it. I really miss it because you go to the games now, and um, everyone wears a mask, of course. Everyone sits eight feet apart, so you really can't even have a conversation during the game. So, um, so it's pretty pretty rough. Um, so it's it's uh, I, I I can't wait for the season to uh, to be over. Yeah, yeah. Did you think you'd be out to as good a start as you are? Yeah, well, veteran team with a good manager, we, we suspected that we would have a pretty good season. We, we thought, you know, preseason that we'd be the best team in our division. Um, you know, it, when you take out all those games and you go from 160 to 60 games and all the, all the different variables with more, more players on the team and some of the rule changes, it adds, um, it adds uncertainty to the outcome when you think you're the best team. Um, but I think our guys have um, – They've been, they've been great about the protocols. We haven't had a positive test since the beginning, uh, since the players reported. The, um, they're taking it very seriously. They're really respecting um, the, the, the season and the opportunity. And so we got off you know, to a great start. And so it didn't surprise me, but um, I, now, we just, now we just have to uh, just focus on you know, you know, bringing it every night and staying healthy and um, you know, keeping it going so we can get to the playoffs. I was surprised because you were, they were so disciplined and they are such a close group and look out for each other. And St. Louis goes and the whole team, because it was, we all know St. Louis is a very boring place. <laughs> they got to St. Louis and they went to a casino and they all got diseased. And now everybody else is paying the price, paying to play a lot of double hunters with them. And they're, you know, they were home the other day in Wrigley. It was, it, it was revolting to have them home in Wrigley. Um, I, I would have thought they would have come up with some sort of penalty where you start with a two-run lead or something and then all these make-up games. Yeah, you know, uh, I, you know the, that never really was discussed at baseball. <laughs> you know, the, but, you know, the, I, I, I mean, obviously a couple teams got, out, you know, got off to a bad start. The Marlins had um, a spread of infections that happened very quickly, and then the Cardinals the, the following, following week. It did set the league back. The, um, the commissioner has done a great job, I think, of scrambling to get those games played. Uh, most of, and even though there's been a handful of games that have been canceled, a lot of them have already been made up again. So, um, so scrambling to get the games played. And, you know, 
I think what happened in Florida and in St. Louis, you know, it probably was inevitable that there was going to happen at some team. And then um, at least the league was ready. They, they made the, they, 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 they got the schedules shifted around and, and it sends a message to the other clubs that, um, you know, even, even the slightest, you know, variation from the protocol could have a pretty big impact. And, you know, as, as all of us read everything about COVID in, in, the, in the paper, we know that, um, you know, it's, it seems like it's, it's, it's um, you know, pretty easily transmissible. Now, the players that have caught it may not have symptoms or not have, you know, dramatic symptoms, but, um, but still it, 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 it you know, transmits pretty easily. So we have to be really careful. And, you know, yeah. the testing protocols are pretty thorough. Like the, every player in Major League Baseball and everyone who is in the, in the dugout gets tested every other day. The league is running 7,000 tests a day. We, we uh, took a, dark, a drug testing facility that we had in Salt Lake that we used to do minor league drug testing and turned that into the, uh, the COVID testing lab. So, um, so I, I give the league a lot of credit for being able to figure out how to use some of our own facilities so we don't drain other people's facilities and then, you know, be able to do 14,000 plus tests a week. And, um, and it, it's, you get tested? what's that? You have to get tested. I don't, I'm not at the high enough level to be tested. <laughs> I'm not, not allowed to go near the players. I'm tier three, which means I can go in the park, but I, I can't, I can't go near anyone, but the, um, uh, but I could, if I asked to be tested. So yeah. but, uh, not required. So tell me how you, um, what do you think of the playoff system this year? Well, I think it's I think it's good to add add rounds to the playoffs. Um, I mean, it adds it adds a level of fan interest for more teams for a longer part of the season. Uh, I don't think, I mean, if if we stay on track to win our division, I don't think it helps us because home field advantage, you know, may not be quite the same thing. You know, there's some talk about playing in you know, you know, doing playoffs in one place. And, um, and of course, even if we didn't do that, then we'd be playing an empty stadium. So I don't, I don't think the expanded playoffs helps the team that wins the division. You have, you'll have to play more playoff, you know, another playoff round and you won't, won't have the home field advantage anyway. But, um, but I think it's good for the game. I think it's the right answer. Uh, I think it's uh, particularly good for fans. We, we, you know, we didn't have enough baseball this year. So another round of playoffs would be good. And I also, and also like one of the, one of the, you know, benefits of this kind of crazy season is we get to try a few things. You know, we're, we're trying to shorten up games, you know, that go into extra innings. So we're starting with the runner on second. We're going to see how that plays out. Obviously the, the, the uh, universal DH went in this year, the extra round of playoffs. So we're, you know, we're looking at, and, and, and now the new rule about relief pitchers facing three batters or finishing the inning. So it's, it's been an okay, you know, one, very, very small silver lining as we're able to um, try a few things this year and see how they work. Now, I heard a rumor that maybe Chicago, Milwaukee could be the hub for, for the playoffs. What do you think of that? That would be nice, but I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how that's going to play out. I mean, you got three real close. I mean, where else could you go to have three stadiums at New York? You don't want to go there. Yeah, I mean, we, we, would, we would have an argument for it if, if that's the way the commissioner wanted to go. But it's, uh, once again, that's a decision for the league. It's his call or the owner's call? Yeah, you know, it's, it's the commissioner's, that's the commissioner's call. He can, he'll, he'll recommend it, I suppose. There may have to be a vote or a discussion at some point. But, but I think, you know, he, he's done a nice job and, and the, you know, the, the teams will go along with what he thinks is best because he'll, he'll have a good decision and a good He'll have it reasoned out in a way that will make sense for all of us. That's good. Um, what What are those rules you talked about? Which ones would you like to see going forward? The ones they put in. Huh. Well, it's it's. You know, um, I, you know, I kind of I do like the uh, relief pitcher rule where they have to face more than one. I think one of the things that um, has hurt the game is the specialized relief pitching near the end of a game. Mm -hmm. You know, like there, there's, you know, for several years in a row, Anthony Rizzo didn't see a right-handed pitcher after the seventh inning. And, um, you know, and I think that it, it forces teams to have relief pitchers that have more in their repertoire than, um, than guys who just come in just to get left-handed batters out. 
And hopefully it, it gets us to the point where we have a few more runs scored late in the game. I, you know, we were at a um, – one of the things that – we don't have a problem with this, actually. Um, uh, but there was there's other teams that have talked about fans leaving a little early because they don't feel like there's, um, you know, a lot of uh, – People feel like there, there's, there's not a lot of late inning comebacks anymore because relief pitching has become so good. Now, the problem at Wrigley, we actually have the opposite problem. No matter what the score was, we still have to send security guards to get everybody out because we're having such a good time. <laughs> but, but, like, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of teams were worried about, like, um, run scoring at the end of the game. So that, that one might be one that, that sticks for a while. Um, I'm kind of mixed on the other ones. I, um, I get the runner on second. It, it's what they've done in the minor leagues for, uh, for a while now. And it, it does save wear and tear on both ends. But, um, you know, we'll see how that plays and how, how fans feel about it. Uh, Universal DH, um, once again, I'm mixed. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I'm really loyal to the, uh, to the, to the, the history of the game and, and to the traditions of the game. But on the other hand, you know, you know, it, you know it's been pretty hard to watch some of these, these pitchers go up to hit, and I'm not sure that's good for anyone. So, I mean, we'll see how that one plays out, too. Yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, next year and hopefully getting fans in the stadium, how's the salary cap look? Well, I think that the, um, the biggest challenge we have right now is to, um, kind of figure out what we have next year. Um, I, I mean, it's no secret that this has been a financial disaster for major league baseball. The, um, the Cubs, for example, they put bank behind you. Yeah, right. That's right. You know, I think the most important thing is you have a good financial partner for these kind of years. <laughs> and, uh, and it is true. And you guys have been great. And we do appreciate it. The, um, but the fact is like, so you, when you look at our, our revenues, about 70% of the revenues for the Chicago Cubs come from game day activities. You know, obviously tickets is number one. And then, and then we have you know, uh, partnerships and parking and concessions and all those things add up to about 70% of revenue. The other 30% is television, um, you know, mostly local television, but then national television as well. And so we're able this year to get back 15 or 16, maybe 17% of what we expected in revenue, which um, is particularly tough because the players are all on guaranteed contracts. They only get paid for the games that happen, but they don't get paid any less because there's no fans in the crowd. Um, so the um, so it, it's been a really tough season for us. The, the biggest question we face right now as a business, and I think a lot of business people are on this call, like um, what do we project for next year's revenue? The, um, you know, we're not sure, you know, what's going to happen with uh, people coming back to the ballpark. We, we just don't know, um, you know, what kind of, you know, is there going to be a vaccine? Is there going to be better treatment protocols? Is, um, are, are, is the city and the state going to be comfortable with larger gatherings next year? Are people going to be comfortable with getting into gatherings with more people next year? It's, um, it's really a complicated question. And as, and as you know, we're, we're a team that models everything financially. We're, we're like as, as number driven as any organization I've ever seen. And it's really, really hard to make assumptions to put into those models to try to understand what's um you know what's our best prediction for next year so so what we can do at the moment um it, it's not much more than just try to wait and see what happens you know try to uh, keep as much optionality in our planning as possible um you know kind of we're talking to experts as as much as we can but but i think we all know as much as we'll know for a while like we have to wait until you know something really uh starts to become uh something definitive on the vaccine front something that's that looks like it's uh, heading the right direction or, or treatment protocols as well. Um, so it's tough. So we're just going to try to buy time, uh, play out our options for a while and as make good decisions as we can as a business. And, um, you know, and just see where it goes. Not good year to be a free agent, I guess. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Like it's um, every team in baseball, baseball as an organization lost around three and a half billion dollars. And so there's 30 teams, uh, large market teams lost a bigger percentage of that. They lost more than their one thirtieth. 
uh, teams with larger payrolls and larger expense bases like the Cubs and the Yankees and the Dodgers, they lost a lot more money, but every team lost money. And every team had to, uh, every team had to go out and look for uh, short-term financing if they didn't have it in place. And everyone had to just figure out a way to survive the season. How other teams look at the free agent market or the player market at the end of the season will be really interesting. I'm sure there'll be a handful of teams that are, will be um, confident that things are going to bounce back and maybe get, you know, get back in with, um, you know, you know, pricing that's comparable to what they might've done in the past, but they're still going to have that extra, extra debt they took on to get through this season. So that's going to have to be a factor. And then there's other teams who, um, you know, who are going to be, you know, have to, maybe they'll be a little more conservative or pessimistic on what's going to happen next year. And we'll, and they'll be saying that I don't think our public health officials will allow us to have fans as early as next April. So we have to be really conservative on what we spend because we had these massive losses this year and we don't want to have massive losses next year. And once again, the players get paid full salary for the games that are played. And so you could be walking into an even bigger loss next year if um, we play 162 games with empty stadiums. That would be, you know, worst case ball club. So it's gonna. It's a great question. I think no one can answer it yet. Just try to like keep our options open and be as flexible as possible. I imagine some of these small market teams are really hurting. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it 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 varies. Although uh, it was a good year to have a low payroll. So um, every game that's played, we lose every game. We lose a lot of money every game that's played. Uh, if you have a smaller payroll, you're losing a little bit less. Uh, I think the other thing from a small market perspective is a larger percentage of your revenue comes from the, the national revenue. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can get, get, the, you know, get the national TV money in for the games that we played in the regular season and the national TV money in for the games that we played in the postseason, that might be a larger percentage of their expensive P&L. So on a percentage basis, they're a little better off than the big clubs. Hmm. Interesting. So I was going to ask you uh, if you had a, if you want to if you want to get one player to add to the Cubs, who would it be? Now you can't afford them, so it's kind of moot. But well, I mean, obviously, uh, Mike Trout's a generational player. Um, I mean, he, he's uh, I mean best player in baseball. But um, but you know, the, but there's a lot of guys we could use the. Uh, <laughs> You know, maybe get some kind of lockdown closer. That guy Hater at the Brewers. Oh my God! I mean, he he mows us down. Like I'm a someone, hater. hater. What's that? I'm a I'm a hater hater. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm a I'm a hater um, unappreciator. I don't I don't, I don't want him <laughs> around. That's why you always got to get a lead. You know, they short. You know, the bullpen in Milwaukee's been so good the last few years. They you know they really shorten the game for themselves. So um, yeah, but Mike Mike Trout would be pretty special, but. Uh, not going to happen. No, probably not. So what do you think of the Crosstown boys now? They're, they, they look young and hungry. Yeah. I mean, I, they yeah. called them what? Murderer's Row again or Yankee? They were referring to him as Murderer's Row, that lineup. Yeah. You give him credit. You know, Rick, uh, Rick Hahn, who's the GM of the White Sox. Even um, though he went to his career. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I talk slower to him, be a Loyola guy. He goes to Detroit. <laughs> Talk real slow to you, so you understand me, Rick. <laughs> well, um, he's done a really nice job, uh, you know, of putting together a good young club. They made the hard decision a few years ago to let go some of their uh, better players to restock the system, you know, and then you get and you get a Moncada or a Giolito out of those kind of trades, and then they they did, you know, what um, what has become the way to win in baseball, which is to try to buy you know buy wins in the future not in the present and invest mm -hmm. in players that um you know obviously lewis robert like uh invest in players that um they're a little bit of cash up front you know they're going to take a few years to get to the major leagues and then obviously they did a nice trade with us they got a couple starters out of a trade for us to to get a starting pitcher um they've done a nice job and you know like we obviously they they, they played us pretty well last weekend winning two out of three and hitting like something like 26 or 27 home runs <laughs> in two games but like the, um, but you know, a lot of times it's not who you play; it's when you play them. And they were hot coming in. They look really good. They look pretty young. Um, they are pretty young. I think they're going to have a, a, a good run in front of them. 
Have you, uh, you, have, you probably haven't watched any of the games that uh, uh, I still call Comiskey Park, but um, at uh, guaranteed rate, have you? But um, I don't know if you see who's sitting right behind home plate. Uh, oh, yeah, there's this really horrible cardboard cutout. Uh, <laughs> I'm large uh, I, I It's hard to recognize it from a distance, but um, – no, I, I have seen I have seen your head I have seen your head there um, in highlight reels, you know. So yeah, they, they, we they, they, uh, they really kind of they, they they told me they wrote you with a picture and said that they flipped me. What's that? That they wrote you with a picture and said they flipped me. And I'm in every game right behind home plate. <laughs> yeah, guy, whatever. Yeah. Well, um, well, they can have the two dimensional version of you. So, uh, <laughs> oh man, who's uh, who do you think is is odds on favorite for the World Series this year? Well, the Dodgers um, look like they really have all the pieces. Um, I think that they, uh, you know, they're they're the class of the National League. I don't think anyone would really argue that. In the American League, you know, the Yankees had a pretty good start, but they've been they've been you know they've had a lot of injuries. And, uh, you know, with the expanded playoff format, I, I don't know if you can really predict what will happen out of, out of the other side. I mean, and, and actually anyone, you know, obviously uh, we consider ourselves to be one of the better teams in the National League and we'll be right in the mix. But I think objectively the Dodgers have the strongest team at the moment. But, you know, it's interesting, unlike football or basketball, where the team with the better regular season record almost always wins, uh, baseball's not like that. Baseball's more like hockey is the same kind of way as baseball where anything can happen in a short series. So, um, so having the best record in, in the regular season or having the best team over the course of 60 or 162 games is a lot less comforting in baseball than it would be in, in uh, football or basketball. So uh, especially, especially with expanded playoffs. So you get, you get to an extra round of playoffs you have a team that has one or two good starting pitchers and anything can happen. So, but I do think, um, you know, I, I think that um, as JD, our announcer put it, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers are probably number one in the AP poll right now because they have the, uh, you know, they just, they just, they have a pretty complete team. And, um, and uh, in the American league, I don't know who I, who I'd say I'm an inside track, although um, if the Yankees get healthy. I think they, they really have something. You think the winner will have an asterisk after the name? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think record books will always denote this was the uh, shortened season. But, um, but I don't think it's – I mean, David Ross put it best. He said, if they're giving away a trophy, I want it. And that's the way our guys are looking at it. Like, this is, this is a, a different kind of competition, um, an abbreviated season with, a, uh, with an expanded postseason. But it's still a competition, and the winner will still deserve to get a ring and to to get a new trophy. And um, it's almost and, harder to play thirty games in one hundred and six or sixty games in one hundred and sixty-two. I mean, every game means something. Yeah, no doubt. You can't. You don't want guys to take a day off. Um, you don't want. Um, you don't want anyone to get hurt. Uh, you know, missing a week of baseball it's like missing three weeks of a regular season, and um, and obviously, uh, you don't want anyone to get uh, sick. And our guys are just, um, you know, I, I can't say enough about how um, seriously they've taken the protocols so that, um, that we've, at least thus far, been able to avoid any, uh, any, any positive tests since, since we reported to camp anyway. Well, uh, when you win the World Series, will the rings be the same size as, the, uh, as when you won the first time? <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's, you know, I think they would have to be, uh, you know, but, um, you know, World Series rings are one of the things that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really great thing. And, I, and I, I, it, was, it was really a, uh, a great experience. But it's kind of funny. Like, baseball teams don't make a lot of money. But then, <laughs> then you, finally, you finally get to the playoffs and you get to the end of the World Series. And you finally have a year where you have a little extra cash flow. And you immediately turn around and spend it on jewelry for every person you know. So the, um, Some of us were very grateful for that, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, the uh, but I, yeah, the rings will be as big. Uh, I, I think you know. I don't think we if we got there, we would not shortchange anyone on the ring size because of the abbreviated season. 
It's good news. Uh, why don't we take one of the uh, poll questions you have out there, Luke? You there, Luke? All right. It's, uh, are you a Cubs season ticket holder? Yes or no? Okay. I answered that, by the way. Just so. <laughs> somebody wrote, somebody wrote, I wish. <laughs> I got to figure out how to get, how do I get the questions on here, Luke? The chat box. How do I get Luke? <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Ed, I'm here. There's, uh, I think we're, we're just about ready to share the results. All righty. 81% are not season ticket holders and 19% are. An opportunity to uh, definitely expand your season ticket holders. <laughs> well, to the 19% uh, that are, thank you very, very much. Um, obviously, the most important fans we have are our season ticket holders, and and hopefully you feel like you're treated well. You know, one of the things that we really focused on ten years ago when we got with, in with the club is making sure that that uh, everyone felt like they were getting the best possible fan experience. And because um, it's interesting in baseball, and um, you know, like the way the, the way I describe it to our staff, our people, our associates is you, know, you got to remind yourself that the way that people feel about the ball club is largely driven by how they feel about attending the ball game. So if, if you come to the, if you come to Wrigley and have a great experience, you're reminded that it's uh, it's, it's a great thing to be part of the Cubs family. It's great, great to be a Cubs fan. If you show up and, and things don't work, then, um, you know, we're, we're taking a risk that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to think that the team doesn't care about, you as much as you care about it. So uh, we worked really hard. Our, our, our uh, net promoter scores are off the charts. We've done a lot to um, really improve the, the game day experience. And that's the physical plant, like fixing up the ballpark and more bathrooms, about 50% more bathrooms, um, more points of sale, uh, you know, and, you know, working on that. And then and helping our, our ushers and other people that work at the ballpark be, you know, better at helping, helping, uh, you know, people at the game. So we, we've come a long way. And so hopefully the 19% of the people who are season ticket holders are happy season ticket holders. And if you're not, send me an email. <laughs> um, what do I got here? Um, you, I'm sure that you're not done expanding around the Wrigleyville area. Um, what do you think uh, next? More parking or more restaurants or well, what do you think is next for that area? I mean, you've been the, the catalyst for overall development and, and really holding the neighborhood to well together. And um, I think you are a very good neighbor. I've, I've seen what you do for the, for the neighborhood. I know you and the Alderman, I may have made up or not. I'm not quite sure. But about now, you know, with everything going on in the city, we need baseball to pull everybody together, and especially in the city of Chicago. Um, you got any other plans for uh, – Development in the Wrigleyville neighborhood? Yeah, not, not immediately. Um, this was going to be one of the years where we all just kind of took stock of what we have. And um, this year was a year without big deadlines or big capital projects. Everything is kind of in place for the most part. We were a couple little things around the ballpark, but that's it. Um, you know, with, uh, with, with things we do outside the ballpark, we're always looking at improving the programming on, on Gallagher Way for families. Um, you know, we like, we like when people bring their kids over just to play on the grass and, and play in the fountain and, or do the yoga classes or the farmer's market, those kind of things. We're always trying to uh, find better ways of programming right there. Um, we're always, uh, you know, always, always just trying to improve the game day experience as well. Uh, but, the, um, but we don't have anything specific or planned going forward for, uh, for new restaurants or anything else. You know, we're just, you know, we're still kind of reeling from the year. Obviously, you know, um, the, obviously the team had a pretty tough year financially, but we have, we do have all the restaurants. We have a handful of restaurants, the rooftops, and of course the hotel, which, um, 
was is an incredibly successful hotel and people love it and it was you know almost all the way full all last summer but you know just reopened but it was closed from march you know march 10th to august 10th something like that so that was tough and so now people if you do have anyone visiting you from out of town uh have them stay at the zachary it's uh it's, it's in good shape uh so that's coming back right now but anyway nothing nothing major nothing nothing big not yet what do you think of um do you think that the ramifications of the sign stealing scandal this came from one of our uh, audience members um do you think they were appropriate or not appropriate and um we don't think who the astros that's when they came to town yeah you know um it's an interesting thing and i think they are appropriate the commissioner of baseball was in a really tough spot uh he wanted to get to the bottom of the story and with, without players telling him what happened he was never going to get anywhere and so i think he made the decision like, i won't i won't punish players that come forward and and, and and tell me what happened and so they got they got a lot of the story out and then um but the players that per, you know perpetrated the you know the the cheating never really had any cost to them but um you know i i think he did what he could and uh he got it out and obviously um a lot of you know a lot of a lot of fans think there there should have been you know other types of um you know other types of punishments or other types of sanctions but um but i i think the commissioner did the best he could I think that um, going forward, we'd have to be really, really diligent. And, um, and you know, if we catch in there, the league has put in some more uh, ways to prevent this from happening again. But, um, but if, if it happens again, then there's going to have to be even harsher punishments. Yeah. Um, collective bargaining is when next year? The current, yeah, the current collective bargaining agreement goes through next season. And so um, at some point, the league and the union will sit down and start thinking about what's next. You don't think they try to preempt it, do it early to get everybody in line in case there's really, you have another season like this next year? Because the money is just, you can't afford another one next year. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's been obviously tough on the teams. I already talked about that. It's been tough on the players as well. They missed, they missed, um, two, you know, whatever, 60% of their season. Um, in, in the past, it hasn't, you know, in previous years, it wasn't uncommon for the league to sit down and to um, to kind of hack through a, a new CBA well before the deadline uh, under, um, you know, under uh, different leadership of the union. Uh, you know, a few years ago, there was a couple of announcements of extensions of the er, new deals before the old deal was even about to expire. And that's obviously optimal. I mean, it's, it's difficult to plan uh, both as as a, as, a, as a, you know, as a team owner or, um, you know, as a player, if you, if you don't know if you're coming back to play. So I, um, I think that would be, that'd be the best answer. Um, I, I'm not involved in directly in any of those discussions. I, I would hope people would want to sit down early, but it, um, I don't know. I just, you know, it seems like time pressure has been, uh, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, the negotiators have tried to use lately. So I don't know. I'm not optimistic that it'll get done early, but it would be the right thing to do in my opinion. I had a good question. I got to find this again. I had a very good question here. Oh, I know it. How's the gambling coming? The sports gaming. Um, are you getting into that or you were? Um... Well, we, um, yeah, the, uh, the, obviously last, a uh, couple years ago, Supreme Court, made it legal for states to choose for themselves if they wanted sports gaming. Uh, Illinois did pass a sports gaming law last year. Uh, they're still working out all the, all the details on it. Um, at some point, I, I imagine we'll, you know, we'll be able to talk about um, having a, a sports gaming partner. Um, we will never be running a, you know, we'll never be like, uh, you know, taking bets or, or you know, running a running a, you know, running a sports book, but we'll you know we'll be looking at a, a way to partner with someone, and um, and we'll see how that goes. It's, uh, you know you know I I think that it's generally good for the game. It adds it adds to fan avidity. It gives you something else to uh, give you another layer of interest in a game. It's um, 
I think baseball plays well into gaming because you, there's so many different discrete events that you can, you can, you know, try to bet on, but, yeah. um, like, but uh, think, like, uh, grass or dirt, you know? Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> Giant mound ball, Mill millions <laughs> of dollars being transferred in mound ball. But the, uh, yeah, so stuff like that. So anyway, there's a, uh, I think, I think it's good for the game in the long run. Um, obviously the league and, uh, and all sports books are concerned about people that have gambling, uh, gambling issues. And I'm sure they will, you know, support those kind of the, the, the groups that support those people. Mm -hmm. But, um, but in general, it's coming, it's in Illinois. And, and uh, it's, I assume at some point we'll have a sports book partner and then we'll see where it goes from there. I have a question here. Is Sammy Sosa always going to be persona non grata with the Cubs? I don't know. I mean, I, if Sammy was, you know, look, my, um, like, Sammy was a great player, uh, one, of the, one of the best players of all time. And regardless of um, anything he did or didn't do off the field, that'll always be the case. And, you know, everything else beyond that, I don't know. We'll see where it goes. We'll just see where it goes. Yeah. He um, reminds me of somebody else who just should just shut up every now and then. <laughs> Sometimes he's no worse than me. Um, we have what? We have another poll question out there. You want to do that, Luke? Regular season. How many Cubs games do you attend? Wait for the answer there. That's the one thing I know that that we that intrigued us when we um, we couldn't afford it. And we signed on as one of the first legacy partners of the Cubs was the fact that you have different people there all the time. In other words, the same people are not at the game. Like the United Center is a wonderful place, but as they tell uh, Jerry and um, Rocky, it's like. Inside of it's like a NASCAR. You can't really differentiate. But at Wrigley, other people see it and they really you get you get such great name recognition. And with it you get the TV too, because it's you know, with some of the games like in hockey, they go, We'll guarantee you 20 seconds of time. It's like, I don't need twice. I'd rather go around on TV and, and advertise that way. But um, you when you look at your fan base and, and where they all come from, I think it's um, it's a uh, it's wonderful for advertising, for sure, in, in park advertising. Yeah, we're, we're really, really uh, blessed with the, the variety of people that we get to the ballpark. Obviously, we have the um, you know, people that live in the city and the near suburbs who are there in and out. And obviously, those are the core fans. But um, there, is all, there really is like as we study our fan base and the different zip codes of where all the tickets are sold and where people are coming from, there's kind of like this Cubs watershed that begins, you know, in, in Western Iowa and goes into, uh, go, begins in Eastern Iowa, in, you know, Michigan, like, you know, just, and there's fans from all over. It's a very regional, it's a regionally popular team. And, and then we just, we get a lot of people from out of town as well. I mean, anyone who, who checks into a hotel downtown and asks the concierge what they should do, they want to go to Wrigley. So um, we get a lot of uh, buses from bars in Cedar Rapids or, uh, or Rockford or places like that, guys coming in and it's their annual trip. Um, we're really, really blessed. And, and as you know, and I walk around every game and just I meet people from all over the world, um, oh, yeah. they're all over the area. And um, it's really special. And, you know, and I look at it, like, we kind of have like three fan bases in my mind. Like number one, we have the people that were born Cub fans. They, they inherited their, their, their fandom from their parents and maybe their grandparents, and maybe their great grandparents. And then we have, you know, we have um, a lot of people who saw us on television around the country when, um, when WGN was a national broadcast and they grew up in Texas and it was the only thing on TV in the afternoon. So they became Cub fans that way. But we also have a third fan base, which I think makes us really unique because we're, we're always renewing our fan base with people that moved to Chicago and a lot of Big Ten graduates or, you know, people from Midwestern schools in particular they move to Chicago and maybe they don't have a team or maybe they have an American league team, but don't have a national league team, but then they come to Wrigley field and they, they, they sit in the bleachers or, or they sit somewhere and have fun and say, okay, you know, this is my team. This is the team I want to associate with. 
So one of the great things we do have is this renewing fan base every year. And we just, um, we don't take it for granted. We just try to give everyone who shows up the best possible experience and hope that, um, you know, we just keep growing the number of people that consider themselves Cub fans. Yeah, the, it's, it's the, uh, oh, well, here we are now with the uh, results. Zero games, 2%, 1 to 5, 63, 6 to 10, 16, 11 plus games, 19. Not bad. Not bad. I bet, I bet it's John Dvorak and his buddies that go to the 19, 20 games. You guys will work for us. Right. Well, 19% of people said they were season ticket holders, so 19% do more than 11 games. There you go. I you do better math than I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got any good questions from the audience out there? I have not uh, seen any. Let me check this out. I'm, I'm such a technical wizard here, Tom. You Hmm. You're going to go to uh, non-paper tickets? Yeah, yeah, that's the, the way it's going. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, yeah, there's, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest ones was, is, uh, is just fraud. You know, the uh, printed home or uh, other types of tickets. We had a lot, we had a big problem in, in the playoffs in 2016, <laughs> people. You know, we had a lot of people standing outside Rigby Field with, with uh, fake tickets that looked as real as real tickets, uh, but they just, you know, they bought them from Scalper, bought them on the street or something like that. Um, ultimately, that's, that's the right answer. And, and, the, and I think there's, um, in general, just a, a trend toward more touchless interactions. Um, you know, that was kind of going that way. Maybe it's more accelerated because of the recent virus issues, but... Um, but uh, yeah, we're definitely trending toward paperless tickets. What's your favorite ballpark next to Wrigley? Oh, you know, uh, good question. I like um, I like the uh, Giants, AT and T Park, where the Giants play. I think they um, they did a really nice job. It's uh, it's on the water. It's it's it has like the like the the cozy warm tones that Wrigley has. It's kind of dark and bricky, but. Um, but I just think they did a really nice job and it's not over the top fancy. It just really works. Uh, obviously Fenway has got a lot of character and uh, I like, um, I like going to Fenway, but I think, I think away from Wrigley, those are the two. I, actually, I like, I kind of like Dodger stadium too. Like, you know, it's, it, uh, getting in and out can be uh, troublesome, but you, know, you get there and it has that kind of sixties kind of Brady bunch feel to it. That like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I just, it's got a different vibe and, and so I like the stadiums that are unique. There are a lot of, there are a lot of ballparks that um, look a lot like the other ballparks. And, and those, those three, those are three of the ones that just don't. So I, uh, those are probably my, my top ones after Wrigley. Yeah. Dodger stadium is pretty cool. You ever caught a ball at a ball game that, that uh, the hit ball? I never have. I've never, um, I was at a Red Sox game after we bought the team with uh, actually with crane and we, a home run, Landed about four feet away, but that's about as close as I've ever been. Uh, <laughs> but never had the luck. Got some questions coming in. Let me just take a look. Yep. Um, who's your favorite ball club uh, other than the Cubs? Uh, they're all tied for last after the Cubs. <laughs> Here's a good one. I think I grew up cheering for the Royals. I grew up cheering for the Royals. The, um, uh, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, right? And the AAA club for Kansas City is in Omaha. So I, you know, um, so as a kid, um, you know, I cheered for the Omaha Royals and therefore cheered for the Kansas City Royals. So if I had, if I had to say an American League team, it would be Kansas City. Who has the, uh, the World Series ending ball? Uh, I do. Uh, it's in the offices. Um, uh, if Rizzo gave me the right one, I assume he did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, we have that at the office. Uh, we we that that is an heirloom of the team, and um, we uh, we have it sitting with the third base um, from that night in, in outside the offices. You don't have home plate though. You know, it's it's kind of 
it's not a not my favorite system. The league takes a lot of that stuff and sells it. Um, you know, they give each team some of the memorabilia from the from the uh, from the games, but then they give it to they give it to their uh, their uh, you know league salespeople and they sell it and, and the league takes it and you get one thirtieth of it, which I think was, I mean, particularly for such a historic World Series as ours, I think was a uh, mistake. But it's just the way they've always done it. Um, so we got some of it. We didn't get all of it. I remember going down to Wayne Heisinger's golf club down the Floridian when he owned it and he had home plate on the first tee. It was pretty cool from when he won. That's pretty, that is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, uh, what Wayne did, what he probably did before baseball got in there, he just went out to the, his own field and just dug it up and took it home with him. He which probably is what I could have done. Had I known how it works, that's what I would have done. But. Why uh, a lot of people talk about streaming uh, the Marquee Network on the uh, uh, through Comcast or Marquee? Well, streaming is um, so the the way it works is, and obviously more people are streaming everything. All you know, content is becoming streamed uh, right now. If you if you're in the local market and you want to stream a game. Uh, from Marquee, you have to work through your uh, your your cable partner or or Hulu, um, or other stream. There are other streaming providers that that, that buy the games, that that have access to the games. Uh, but it's it's um, you know local streaming is becoming a you know, become a thing, but it has to be authenticated with your local broadcast partner. Yeah. Uh, from what you told me, what I've read, it's um, figuring out the uh, television rules, like figuring out the units on your phone bill. Oh, where you can't go and where you can't and can't do and well and you know and my inbox this year got filled up with people who live outside our home television territory that want marquee network and i i, I said i'd love to give it to you but i can't like i'm not allowed i'm not allowed to put games on if it's uh you know if, if you live in michigan or if you live you know i mean we, the white Sox and the cubs share a territory but a lot of teams just have territories under themselves and there's some kind of you know, just it's it's really hard to, um, you know, to to figure all that out. Um, but I think you know what's really important for us, and Marquee is going to be a big part of it, as you talk about like streaming and, and and fans and how they take content. Like, what we have to do, and we have to leverage the fact that we have Marquee, and the Marquee app is great. If you, if anyone hasn't downloaded that, go do that. We have to get to the point that we're we have a one to one relationship with with our fans. You know, it used to be enough that you could just give some information to a newspaper and they would print it and that would, that would be out there. Or you just give your games to a t cable channel and they'd put it out there. Um, you, know, the, you know, both of those old, those, those models are, are challenged. You know, fewer people are, are buying cable every year or, or, or satellite every year. Fewer people are buying newspapers every year. So the, 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 the ways you used to relate to your fans, the ways you got your information out to your fans are changing. And, and it's a, it's a challenge, it's, it's a minus on some, some respects, but for us, we see it as a, a really important opportunity where we can leverage technology to try to get more content, more, more specific content to our fans as much as we can. So um, that's, our, you know, that's the, gonna be the, the, the macro challenge for sports over the next 10 years as, as the cable model changes a bit and as the newspaper model changes a bit. And, um, and we, hopefully we're up to it. So hopefully everyone's downloaded the Marquee app. Um, it's got great content. <laughs> Over time, what we're going to do is, you know, continue to try to find ways to push content that people appreciate to them in the format that they want to take it. Yeah, uh, it, it's an interesting, brave new world now in terms of, you know, I mean, just think of out here in Rosemont, we usually have 1,600 people. We have 100 people now. Everybody's working at home. It's working really well. You wonder how that's going to change a lot of different things, including and how it fits into the te technology of how you touch your customers. It's um, because, you know, we're built on the personal service model. It served us extremely well, especially recently when people had to get their PPP loans and couldn't talk to anybody in a big bank. And we knew everybody. That's, that's, I don't know. I still think money is a commodity. It's a commodity, but it's, it's not like bread. It's like my money, you know? You want to know where it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting, and you make a great point. Like, 
we've, there, there's two great takeaways from this dislocation. And one is that you're going to have to be better at automating services because you can't always be physically with the clients or you can't physically perform the services that you want to. But yet at the same time, this, this dislocation and, and this, the pandemic has reminded us how important it is to have good partners and have people you trust to work with. And obviously we, we, we very much value and treasure the partnership with, with Wintrust, but you know, for, and, our, and our other big partners, and, and the time that we spent getting to know our, our great partners, and the, there's Gallagher and, and American Airlines and the other ones that we work with, you know, at the time it just felt like good good thing to do, but it really became very important for us when the season got dislocated. And I, I would think, mm -hmm. and, and from the Wintrust standpoint, the time that your people spent getting to know, getting to know the customers and getting to know other challenges, I mean, um, I'm sure there are, there are a lot of people on this call and a lot of people around the Chicagoland area who feel like you were really true partners in a, in a time of real crisis. Yeah. I hope so. Hopefully we'll get through this crisis and uh, get back to normal. Tom, I want to thank you for spending the time with us today. I think we're at our appointed hour. And um, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time and certainly appreciate the uh, partnership. And even though you see me at uh, my cutout at, at uh, uh, Sox Park. Um, I'm still a Cubs fan. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks. It was great to be here. Um, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person soon. Yeah, Luke, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, great job playing the role of interviewer tonight. I think the, uh, the ghost of Harry Carey would approve 100%. And, uh, you know, uh, Tom, you mentioned the importance of great partners, Ed. You've been a phenomenal partner to us, so we're very grateful for that. And, and thank you, Tom, for sharing your time, your stories, uh, your perspectives on the future um, with everyone who tuned in for this really rather unique chance to go behind the scenes with, with you guys and with the Cubs um, in general. And to, to close it out, I guess I'll say that if there's one word to sum up this year, it's the word resilience. And I think a lot of the things that you've spoken about, Tom, it's you guys being very resilient and adaptive to changes. And I'd also contend that the Cubs have had 108 years to master the skill of resilience. So if there's a, a year for the Cubs to shine, it is definitely 2020. I have no doubt about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we know it's been a tough year, obviously, for you, for the players, for, for everyone's families. Um, but we're all rooting for you. So we're all, the whole city is behind you. Uh, Ed and Tom, great listening to you guys tonight. I think this interview might be episode one for the 2 a.m. Ed Wamer show. Our marquee network. We'll see. Maybe we'll get bumped to bumped up to 1:30 a.m. If if the uh, the ratings are good. So uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. Stay well, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Luke.